Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're having a bit of fun. I'm creating the ultimate wildlife camera. I'm gonna take the best parts of Sony, Canon, Olympus, and of course, Nikon, to create what I'm calling the DP1. This is the best wildlife camera that gets rid of all the cons, grabs all the pros, and puts them into one camera. Of course, this is just a bit of fun. This camera doesn't exist. It's based off my own personal preferences. I'm gonna be picking the best sensor, the best AF, which is the best mount, and amalgamating them all into this one amazing camera. And I'd love you to do the same, and in the comments, let me know what your dream camera is. Now, of course, this is purely subjective. I'm a wildlife shooter, so this camera is gonna be purely wildlife based with a focus on birds. All right, let's start with the body. What forms the foundation of this camera? It's really hard to go past the form factor of these big pro bodies. They balance the big lenses that we use really well. They have massive batteries that just last all day. Now, I'm not gonna base it on this old 1DX. It kinda narrows us down to the Canon R3 and the Nikon Z9, both excellent cameras. However, for me, having used both of them, I prefer the feel and the weight of the Canon R3. It's significantly lighter than the Z9. I'm used to the Canon ergonomics. It just feels good in my hand. I know where the buttons are. So I'll be going with the R3 as the foundation for the DP1. Now, in terms of weather sealing, a lot of these brands don't actually tell us what their rating is. However, one does, and that's this Olympus OM-1. This currently has an IP rating of 53, which means this is arguably one of the best weatherproofed cameras, interchangeable lens cameras on the market. This can handle just about everything you throw at it. So I want the camera to have the best possible weather sealing. So we go with the OM-1 weather sealing. All right, so let's start with the back of the camera and I've made a lot of changes from the original R3. I've grabbed a few bits from a lot of other cameras. The first thing you can probably notice is the actual control wheel from the Canon R7. When I first saw this, I was a little bit critical of it. I thought that's a bit of a gimmick. That looked weird. Why would you put that there? I'm so used to the dial being on the back of the camera with Canon. However, after using the R7 in the field a number of times, I've grown to actually really like this control dial and joystick by your thumb. It's just extremely handy. It's close to the AF on button and I actually prefer it now. So it goes to show once you try things, sometimes you change your opinion. So for me, I would keep Canon's top three back button design from their pro bodies. I've been using them for years, I'm used to it. Why would I want three buttons? For me personally, it's how I have my autofocus set up, especially with eye tracking. So for me on AF on, I actually have that to eye tracking. So on Canon, I can just hit IF and it intelligently finds the eye of the bird and just tracks it around. Now if I gets confused and I want spot autofocus, I just purely hit the second back button and it focuses as spot, no tracking. I don't need to go to AF on, I don't need to push any other buttons, I just simply push that second button and hold that down for spot. If I wanna go back to eye, I just go to AF on and I love that. Third button, it's kind of a bird and flight emergency button or it could be whatever you want. So I've got three AF modes on three different buttons and they all just work by pushing down the button. I can just push down the button on whichever autofocus I want. I don't really like flicking switches, pushing buttons to change AF modes. I get confused and I just like that three button layout that gives me access to three different unique autofocus modes straight away. Now I love lots of buttons on my cameras because I like to customize them and I actually don't mind the little switch on the OM-1. We've got AEL and there's this switch next to it that you can just flick. Now you can set that up for whatever you want. On the Olympus, you use it for AF zones, but you could say have Pro Capture, which I'll talk about soon. You could maybe have Pro Capture on, Pro Capture off, and use the button for whatever you want. I also like the ability that you can hold down that button and then turn one of your wheels to scroll through. So say your drive modes or your eye tracking modes or whatever it is, that's really cool to hold down a button and just turn the dial. So I'll definitely have that extra button and that extra switch and you can set it up however you like. Now in regards to the rear dial that Canon have been using on their pro bodies, it works but it doesn't have any buttons on it. It's only got the middle button for the set and just the control wheel. I don't know why Canon do this because as soon as you pick up a Sony body and you've got the control wheel and you've got these buttons built in. So I would definitely use the Sony rear control dial. It's just awesome to have that customization to have five customizable buttons and a control dial all built into one. So I'd definitely go with Sony's rear control dial. So in terms of the actual EVF, it's quite important in these cameras to have the best EVF we can get. And at the moment, Sony are leading the way. I believe they have the highest resolution at 9.4 million dots, which means that the resolution is fantastic. The bird looks great. And the thing that a lot of people don't consider is the actual size of the EVF. The Sony one is actually the biggest EVF and it just makes the magnification bigger and it's easier to look through the viewfinder. If you've ever 
ever grabbed a small body like one of the more affordable R10s, the viewfinder is tiny and the magnification isn't very good. And when you look through it, you just struggle to actually pick up the bird and make it big. The viewing experience just isn't very good. So I would definitely be going with Sony's EVF. Obviously it would be blackout free and um, that high quality, so that's great. And staying with Sony, I would actually probably use the A7R5 rear screen. That seems to be the best of both worlds. It's got the Nikon pulling out and up, and then it also has the flipping around. So if you wanted to do vlogging or whatever, you could see yourself. It's the best of both worlds. I think that's the best screen. Obviously it'd be fully touch and even touch on the menus, and it would be a high quality rear screen. So that's how I would sort of have the back of the camera set up. Now when it comes to the top of the camera, I've made a few changes there as well. You'll see on the left hand side, I've actually grabbed the new Nikon Z8 design there. I like buttons as I've mentioned. I would probably create four custom buttons that you can do whatever you want with and you can just push them to change to different modes or whatever it is. Just having access to those four buttons could be quite handy on that side. In terms of the little LCD screen, Nikon Z9 currently or Z8 has the largest screen so I would be going with that one over the R3 and then I'd have a few buttons on top. One of the biggest challenges or my frustrations with a lot of these cameras is how we switch from photo to video. On the early Canon models, it was actually painful to switch from video. You had to do it on the actual dial. The R7 here has improved it. It's on a switch. We can just go on and off, which is good. However, I prefer the Z9 and the R3, how you have the record button and the switch on the record button. It just makes it much easier. I've decided to put it on top of the camera so you can quickly hit record and you can quickly change from stills to video in that one motion with your finger. And you'll also notice that I actually prefer how Canon have their front shutter button and then they have the dial behind that, the front dial. Most other brands have the dial in front of the shutter. I'm just used to that button and the dial behind it. So I'd sort of stick with where the Canon shutter butter is. It just feels good in my hand and that's what I'm used to. Now in terms of the front of the camera, not really changing it much from the R3. We've got the two buttons on the front that we've had forever on these pro bodies. That gives you the ability to customize those buttons however you want and I would just sort of leave it as is. So let me know in the comments what you think of the ergonomics and the body. How would you change it? Have I got too many buttons? Possibly. Have I missed things out? Do you like dials as opposed to buttons? Let's get a conversation going. Let me know what your dream camera would be. Now that we've got the outside of the camera sorted, probably the next decision and choice we need to make is the actual mount. That is, what lenses are we able to attach to the camera? And every brand has a range of really good lenses and it's very difficult to choose one specific system. For example, Sony currently have a wide array of lenses because they've had their mount out, or their mirrorless mount out probably for the longest. Therefore, they've got loads of third-party lenses. They've got lots of native lenses. Just the 200 to 600, this lens up here, it's just awesome. So Sony have a really good range of lenses. Canon are well known for their lenses. You've got all your EF lenses. You've got all your RF lenses. For me personally, because I'm wildlife focused, I want the very best wildlife lenses available. And at the moment, there's one brand that is leading the way and beating all the others, and for me, that's Nikon. Nikon currently probably have one of the best lenses available for wildlife. That's the new 600 f4 with a built-in 1.4 converter. My good mate Jan has had the pleasure of using that lens. He raves about it, absolutely loves it. The image stabilization is excellent. The ability to go from 600 to 840 is just awesome. You can see in this viewfinder footage, how useful this is just to have those two options just by flicking that switch quickly. That lens is absolutely incredible and that would be the lens that I would attach to this DP1. Now of course we need a few other options for bird and flight if we want something lighter. You've got the fantastic 400 4.5, the 500 5.6. If you want a zoom lens you've got their fantastic 100 to 400 and they're about to release a 200 to 600. And of course you've also got the 800 6.3. Nikon are just killing it in terms of lenses. So the mount I would go with is Nikon's Z mount. That would be the mount with the best lenses for wildlife in my opinion. Now that leads us to the sensor. What sensor are we putting inside this body? And boy there's a lot to choose from. But for me with wildlife I want a very fast stacked sensor to reduce our rolling shutter. Faster the sensor the better our autofocus with all those extra AF calculations that are possible. I want lots of megapixels so I can crop in heavily, good dynamic range, 
good noise control. So that narrows us down to the Z9, which is the and Z8, which is the 45 megapixel Nikon stacked sensor. That's the fastest sensor on the market. Absolutely fantastic. And then we've got the Sony 50 megapixel from the A1, also stacked has great um, dynamic range. I've used both of them on the Nikon. I managed to capture this wonderful Beachstone Curlew that I absolutely love. And on the Sony, I've captured heaps of Cape Barren geese, parrots, and all sorts of other things. So it's really a toss up. But when we look at the noise performance and the dynamic range, the Sony has a slight edge and it has those extra five megapixels. So for the sensor, I'll be going with Sony's 50 megapixel sensor, and I'm sure that will take wonderful photos. So in regards to the in-body image stabilization, at the moment, I think Nikon lead the way. Sony and Canon are very good, but if you shot video with Nikon with their latest lenses, it's so steady, it's ridiculous. You can shoot handheld video, which you simply cannot do on Sony. You'll struggle to do it even on Olympus. Canon's not too bad, but Canon have this weird wobble thing going on with their IBIS. I don't know what's causing it, but they've got this weird thing that they need to sort out. So for me, Nikon leads the way in terms of the IBIS. All right, so what FPS are we gonna have on this camera? Ideally, I'd love to go with the Olympus. They get 50 frames per second on their pro lenses, just fantastic. You probably end up with too many photos, but I don't think that's technically possible on a 50 megapixel camera. You just hit the buffer too quickly. So we're gonna to have to use less. I would probably go with the Sony 30 frames per second, and that would be more than enough, but I'd love to be able to have that variable FPS. Like you can choose 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, or 30. It'd give the user the ability to choose whatever frame rate they want, and of course it would be blackout free shooting. Now what would be really cool is if you were able to shoot in crop mode, so say we had the Sony A1 and we put it into crop mode, it then gave you the ability to have 50 frames per second in the crop mode. That would be really cool and that would be a great feature. So if you wanted 50, you could get it, but you had to shoot in a crop mode. And the other feature with the FPS and the buffer, I don't know why Canon can't do this, but on Canon, once you hit the buffer, you can't take any more photos. The camera just point blank refuses. It makes you miss shots. It's highly annoying. Whereas the other brands like Sony, they allow you to shoot continuously, but at a reduced frame rate. So I would definitely implement that in the body um, to enable you to, even if you do hit the buffer, the camera at least will still take photos. At, I think it's between five and 10 frames per second. That would definitely be a feature. Now, of course, this camera would have Olympus's fantastic pro capture. I'm not sure why the other brands haven't been able to compete with Olympus in this regard. They enable you to capture up to 50 frames before you take a photo and you can adjust that to whatever you want and then they store, they're stored as single raw files. They don't group them together to create some weird thing. It's raw, you can keep shooting afterwards. Olympus by far have the best Pro Capture so I'd be using the Olympus Pro Capture and I would love to be able to actually just activate Pro Capture with that one button, turn it on, turn it off, that would be great. And to store all those photos we would be using the Nikon Z9's dual CF Express B cards. They are the fastest cards on the market, much faster than the Sony CF Express A cards. So we would definitely be using two of those. And just to keep control of our buffer so we can see it visually, I would actually adopt Canon's pre-capture buffer overlay. If you're not sure what that is, on the Canon and Pro pre-capture, when you start holding down the shutter, this buffer bar starts filling up. It's a vertical bar, and it lets you know when your buffer's getting full. Unfortunately, that doesn't work in normal stills. I would love it in normal stills, so you can see graphically on through the EVF where your buffer is, so you know whether you need to slow it down or not. Uh, that would be a great feature. That leads us to probably the most important part of this camera, and that's the autofocus. What autofocus system are we going to go with? And it's tricky, all of them are very good. However, I think Olympus technology is currently leading the way. It's a bit of mouthfuls, so I need to get this right. Olympus have cross quad pixel technology with 1053 focus points. That just means, I think it uses contrast and phase, and it's just really good at not locking on the background and finding the subject. So I think that technology is currently really, really good, and that's the technology I would base the AF on. I know it's on a Sony sensor, they'd have to mix it up, but I believe Olympus is definitely leading the way in that regard. What algorithm would I currently use? It's hard to go past Canon. I just prefer how Canon implement their IAF. It just seems to work. It seems to find that subject really quickly, sticks to the eye, we get the little focus box on the eye, and it just works. On the Sony, it just takes a little bit longer to find the eye of the subject and stick to it. So I just prefer that. Now, the Olympus, it's good, but it doesn't quite work as well for me on subjects on the ground. However, when we go to the sky and we start doing bird and flight, 
Well, that's really hard to choose because Sony is extremely good and Olympus has been impressing me. I really love doing bird and flight with the Olympus and I'll do a video on that on the future. Enabled me to capture these swallow shots just flying through the sky. And obviously with the Sony, I was able to capture backlit shots of this egret flying past this cockatoo without any issue. We are so lucky to have the autofocus systems we have for bird and flight. So it'd be a combination of a lot of things, but mainly Canon. Um, but I don't think this camera would ever let us down in terms of autofocus. There is one special feature that this camera is gonna have, and that's the no grass feature. I don't know why these cameras have so much trouble with grass, but I haven't met a camera yet that doesn't like or get attracted to grass. The autofocus just seemed to go to it even when there's a subject. These cameras should be smart enough. The algorithm should be able to detect, okay, I'm photographing a bird, don't go to the grass or the branch in front of the bird. So the algorithm would definitely be tweaked so that it avoids the grass and those branches and sticks to the subject. And one last feature this camera will have, and it's actually adopted from Panasonic, and that's the ability to have a near and far focus on a button on the camera. What do I mean? If you've ever shot with mirrorless and say you've got a bird on a perch and you're photographing it and this camera for whatever reason goes to the background and you want to pull it back to the perch or pull focus back quickly, on Panasonic, you have the ability to program a button that just pulls the focus to a set point. So I could just quickly push a button and the focus comes straight back to a certain point. Now you can sort of do this on big pro lenses like the 500 f4, it's got a button. You can set the button at a certain distance, push the button, turn it, and it comes back. It's just a bit of a faff to do that on the lenses. I would much prefer to have it on the body. So you say you had a bird on a perch, you just push the body to record the distance, push it again and it goes straight to it. Another button for far away, so for bird and flight if you want to send it back out. It'd just be awesome. I'm not sure why these bodies all don't have that feature to set different distances via the body. So it would definitely have that feature. Now in terms of video, I don't have a lot of experience. So for this camera, I'd probably just adopt what Nikon are doing with their Z9, 8K, 4K, 120, good tracking, really good IBIS. Just seems to work extremely well. I would love to have uh, ND filters built into the body. So if you're shooting in uh, sunny conditions, you can keep that shutter speed low. That would be one feature. But in regards to video, just go with the Z9. That leads us on to the color science of this body. Which one am I gonna use? Well, I think Canon and Fuji have a lot of fanfare around their color science. So I'd probably go with one of those. I've shot with all the bodies and to be fair, I can get good colors out of any body that I use. So with Canon, I've definitely shot lots. Even this Mulga Parrot, it's taken on the old 7D. Love the colors on that. With Sony, I've shot this Sticula. Love the warm colors. The colors look great to me. With the Olympus, I've took some wonderful shots of those Dotrels recently. Love the colors in that. And with Nikon, love the colors on the Southern Emu Ren. In the end, you've got so much ability and post to correct colors and do different things. It's not a major issue for me. I'll probably throw Fuji a bone and just give it the Fuji color science. At least then we've got something Fuji related in this body. So that's what we'd go with there. Now, one of the biggest risks we have in wildlife photography is blowing our whites. We do not want to blow the whites. Sometimes the camera, especially in auto ISO, can get confused if the background's too dark or the background's too bright. It either over or under exposes our subject. So ideally, we don't want to do that. We do have the histogram and the viewfinder, which is excellent. And that's a really good visual guide to let us know. However, Sony, and Olympus have gone one step further. With Sony, they give you zebras in the viewfinder. What that means is we get this black and white line on any part of the image that's overexposed or blown. It's just a signal to you, or I better slow down, I better turn down the exposure. So that's awesome. Olympus do it slightly differently. They actually make the overexposed area go orange. It's immediate impact. Oh gee, I'm overexposed here. I better turn it down. And I actually prefer the way that Olympus do it. And they also have a uh, shadow warning, which goes blue. So I would implement Olympus's uh, highlight exposure warning in this body. It just seems to work for me. I love it. All right, now the camera would definitely have an audible shutter. I know many of you are going, why do you want an audible shutter when it's silent and electronic? Because I like some sort of feedback. I like to know when I'm taking photos. And there'd be one special feature in this camera and it'd be called the 1DX mode. As soon as you put it in the 1DX mode, it goes to 12 frames per second and it gives you this sound. How can that not bring a smile to your face? If the camera had the 1DX mode, I'd be probably using that all the time. It just sounds awesome, makes me smile. So I'd love to have that feature. So in terms of the menu, I personally like Canon's menu. I am used to it, but I just find it so intuitive. I find it easy to find where I need to go. It's all categorized extremely well. 
The Sony is a little bit confusing. I'll give Sony some credit that they have the most customization. They enable you to customize just about everything. Nearly every button can be customized. The custom modes can be customized. Recall different autofocus settings. It's just amazing how much customization Sony has. So I'd love to include all the features that Sony have, but in the actual Canon menu. Olympus isn't too bad, but I'm annoyed that on this Olympus it's not touch screen enabled. So it would definitely be touch screen enabled and I just prefer those Canon menus, so that's what I would go with. Now when we look through the actual EVF, um, I don't have a preference to be honest about which one I use. Again, I'm probably like the Canon EVF. However, I very much like the percentage in the viewfinder on the Olympus and the Sony for the battery to tell you what percentage battery is left. And this camera would have be much like a phone, it's gonna give you a warning when your battery is getting low. It's gonna say 10% left, 5% left, like it'll start, have some sort of massive warning or red around it to let you know that your battery is about to die. I know a lot of cameras that does turn red, but I just don't see it when I'm shooting and I've, I've lost battery a number of times. It might be my problem, but I'm not sure if any of you have had that problem. I just like a better warning that the battery's getting low. I would also implement the feature where you can set the EVF to have a crop factor. So say you went to a 1.5 crop factor in the EVF, but the actual images that were taken were full frame. So crop in the EVF, but capture full frame. It just enable you with the birds a little bit smaller to make the bird bigger, enables you to um, see it better, maybe autofocus a little bit easier, but capture the full image and then crop and post so you don't miss anything and you include all that habitat. That would be a really cool feature. Now in terms of some cool features, it probably adopt a lot of the ones that Olympus have gone for. They've got live ND if you're shooting landscapes. They've got a high sort of res mode to capture multiple images. I know other brands have that too. They also have a live composite or focus stacking inside the body. So definitely use a lot of their features, time lapse, etc., all that sort of stuff. I don't use it a lot for wildlife, but I know a lot of other people do. Alrighty, so that's my DP1. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what you think of the DP1. Would you buy it? It's got amazing features. If we were to summarize this body, it's just the ultimate wildlife camera. You know, it's built like the R3, it's built like a tank, the battery that lasts all day, that wonderful 50 megapixel sensor from Sony. We've got the Z mount, which gives us access to all of Nikon's amazing lenses. We've got a high frame rate. We've got excellent dynamic range. The image quality is gonna be fantastic. We've got the autofocus technology of Olympus paired with Sony and Canon's autofocus algorithms. I think the camera would just be awesome and I would love to use it. It's got all the buttons I need to quickly autofocus and switch between different things. We've got four dials for all of our different exposure inputs, even auto ISO if you wanted to adjust that. It's pretty much the camera that achieves everything for me. The EVF is gonna be amazing. The LCD is gonna be fantastic. Overall, I would love to own that camera. Of course, that camera is never gonna exist. However, it just shows what's available today that wasn't you know, five years ago. We are so fortunate today to have access to these kinds of cameras. Every brand can take amazing photos and that's just awesome for us as consumers. I'd love to hear in the comments how you would change your wildlife camera. Would you buy the DP1? How would you change it? Who would you have used? I'd love to read those comments, everybody does. Uh, if you see a little bird next to a name in the comment, that means that they're a member of the channel. If you don't know what that is, a member supports me to help make these videos. It costs less than a cup of coffee per month. You get that emoji. You get access to the 2023 digital calendar, 4K high quality images. You can download it for your laptop, your PC, or your tablet. If you like the video, obviously give it that thumbs up. Subscribe if you wanna see more of these types of videos. Until the next one, take care, happy birding. See you later.